In this video, I'll be showing you a surveillance camera system that I just installed. This system is completely self-contained, producing its own power and transmitting data back to my network without any wires or physical connections. In early 2016, I produced a video series on a solar-powered surveillance camera system that I was installing at a job site. I got a lot of positive attention and feedback on that series, so today I'm going to do an updated 2020 version of that same type of system. The camera I'll be installing will be to keep an eye on my autistic daughter as she jumps on the trampoline, which is her favorite thing to do in the whole world. As you'll notice later on in the video, I could have pretty easily installed this camera on the side of my house and then run an ethernet cable to it. But I wanted to use this as an opportunity to demonstrate to all of you how to set up a completely remote wireless surveillance camera system powered by solar and do it the right way. Because there are plenty of kits out there that you can buy for a lot of money I might add, and almost all of the ones I have seen are terribly underpowered. Now before we get started, please understand this is an overview video walking you through my thought processes, component selections, and installation steps. I will explain to you what I'm doing as we go, but this was not intended to be a step-by-step -step guide for you to copy exactly what I did. If there's enough interest, maybe I can do a video series on that later and show every little screw and wire as I go. So if you're interested in that, leave a comment after the video. Anyways, I did purchase all the components used in this video with my own money, so this is not a paid endorsement or review video at all. If you want to see the full parts list for this build, check out the video description where I'm going to put a ton of useful info for you guys. I'll also put my email address and consulting rate in there in case anyone wants to contact me for a one-on-one -on -one help session designing a system for you. Now just a warning, this is going to be a long video, but I have added timestamps in the video description so that you can fast forward if you want to skip ahead or rewatch different sections. Having said all that, the first thing that I did for this project was plan and prepare. By that I mean assessing my needs, doing the calculations for the solar power, and making sure everything will work together. I took several weeks for this step as this is the most critical part of the process. Some people may be tempted to buy a pre-packaged kit or just guess their needs without doing their homework. Those systems are usually going to fail to meet your expectations. There aren't any corners you can cut here, trust me. Anyway, the four things that I or anyone else designing a system like this needs to determine for the planning phase are your geographic location, which will tell you how many sun hours you can expect, the energy consumption of the surveillance camera, charge controller, and networking equipment, which I'm just going to call loads, the number of hours that those loads will run each day, and the amount of reserve battery capacity that are needed for inclement weather. All of that information can be found with some careful internet searching. I would recommend using at least two sources for the information to be sure it is accurate. After collecting that information, I like to use a pretty basic calculator online that simplifies the math for me. I've shown the full detailed math in previous videos, and that will be the most accurate way to dial in your system. However, I understand that most of you will want to just use an easy calculator and plug in some numbers and get close enough. In my case, I like to get close enough and then add some safety margin on top, usually around 20% extra. It's far better to spend a couple extra bucks and then never have an issue than it is to go as cheap as possible and then have an underperforming system when you find out that your camera uses a little more power than you thought or there's a tree nearby with birds that like to take a crap on your solar panel or something like that. Finally, after doing all of the calculations, I ended up needing just under 80 watts of solar panel and a little over 16 amp hours of battery capacity. Now if this were a mission critical camera that I could not afford to ever be down, I would have bumped up the reserve capacity. But chances are, if the weather is bad, my daughter won't be jumping on the trampoline anyway, so the camera won't be used. Again, those are my needs and my choices, so make sure you think about your own situation and plan accordingly. After running the numbers and determining how much power and capacity I needed, the next thing I did was choose the rest of my components. Some of these pieces I chose earlier because I needed them for my calculations. Others I chose after the calculations, such as the batteries, because you obviously have to know the capacity required before you can select them. 
Anyway, the camera I chose is a Ubiquiti UVC G3 bullet camera, which is a newer model of the same cameras I used in 2016. I've been a fan of Ubiquiti networking products for a long time, and I use their gear in a lot of my IT work for my day job. Networking is their bread and butter, especially wireless point-to-point -point networking, but their cameras are pretty good too. This camera also comes with everything that I need to mount it to a pole. I also found that it uses 4 watts of power at the most over standard PoE. For my solar charge controller, I chose a Ubiquiti SunMax Solar Point. This is a lesser known product that most people have never heard of. I haven't seen too many people use it before, so I wanted to check it out. Unfortunately, Ubiquiti pulled out of the solar industry, and so this product may be discontinued in the future. But these units are still for sale as of this video. The reasons I went with this controller instead of a more mainstream product are because it has a built-in 4-port PoE switch, maximum power point tracking technology, and some cool features such as an online dashboard with weather tracking, data logging, and prioritization of loads. It's also weatherproof and can be mounted directly to a pole. This is actually a pretty big deal because it will save me room inside my enclosure. The only thing I don't like about this device is that it's not compatible with lithium batteries. And that's kind of a big deal, but I still wanted to try it out and see how good it is. In order to integrate my remote video feed into my home network, I needed a wireless bridge. So to take care of that, I chose to stay with Ubiquiti and use a NanoBeam AC Gen 2 radio. Again, this is where Ubiquiti built their reputation and they make awesome stuff for point-to-point -point and carrier grade wireless. And I knew that this radio would be fully compatible with the PoE output of the solar point charge controller. Now, if anyone is going to copy my build, here is a warning. If you aren't proficient with IT stuff and networking specifically, you may want to use a wireless bridge system that is a little easier to set up. Not that this unit is hard to set up, but it is definitely not plug and play. For my solar panel, I chose to try out a new low cost solar panel company that is available on Amazon called New Power. I chose to use a 100 watt solar panel that they are selling for 80 US dollars. To mount that solar panel, I chose to also use their pole mount system that will work for up to 100 watt panels. I chose a 100 watt solar panel to give me an additional 20% capacity on top of the 80 watt minimum required according to my calculations. For my batteries, I would normally go with MillerTech, but as I mentioned, my charge controller is not compatible with lithium iron phosphate batteries. So I chose some Mighty Max 12 volt 9 amp hour sealed lead acid batteries that are available on Amazon. I ordered four of them and designed my system to use them in series and parallel to create a 24 volt 18 amp hour battery bank. So why did I go with four batteries instead of one larger one? First, the solar point charge controller will only output to a 24 volt battery or battery bank. And 24 volt batteries are pretty rare. Second, Smaller batteries are easier to fit in a small pole mounted enclosure and the 9 amp hour size of SLA battery is an easy size to work with. Finally, as I mentioned earlier in the video, I needed at least 16 amp hours of capacity to make this work. So by putting the 24 volt and the at least 16 amp hour requirements together, you end up with 4 batteries. So this is a great example of why the planning phase is so critical. And last but not least, I needed a battery box. So I chose a polycarbonate pole mount enclosure from Altelix. This box is NEMA 3 rated, which means it is for outdoor use and protects against dust, rain, sleet, and ice. In 2016, I went with a steel box from Tycon Power, and that was a really great box. But for 300 US dollars, it's a little pricey, and I really didn't need all that space since my charge controller can be mounted directly on the pole. Also, that steel box was very heavy and would have been a bit cumbersome on the small diameter pole that I will be mounting my system on. The rest of my system is just miscellaneous hardware, wires, and safety devices. If you're copying my build, this will be where your system will most likely differ quite a bit and will probably involve a few trips to the hardware store. It's pretty difficult to visualize every nut and bolt and connector you'll need for a system until you get the main components in hand. In fact, the inside of the enclosure is completely empty, 
so I already knew I was going to have to fabricate some sort of mounting system for the four batteries. So I had to order the box and batteries first, and then play around with them in person to see how they would fit and how I could attach some brackets to keep them in place. So there was some trial and error and trips to the store that I did off camera that you'll also have to figure out on your own. After completing all the planning and buying, I moved on to the next step, which was the installation. While I was in the planning phase, I went ahead and installed the pole that I would be using to mount everything to. I chose a 10 foot section of one and a quarter inch EMT conduit as the pole because it's cheap, strong, and readily available at my hardware store. Please keep in mind that this pole will not be a good choice for all applications, and I'm not a construction professional or expert on setting poles. I'm doing this project mostly as a demonstration and may decide to remove the pole in a few years or maybe even less. So I did not set the pole as deep in the ground or with as much concrete as you probably would if this were going to be a permanent installation. When setting the pole, I made sure that it would have direct line of sight to the location of the other end of the wireless bridge. A wireless bridge most likely will not function at all without line of sight, and the signal can be significantly attenuated by trees. I also considered other factors such as HOA regulations, potential concerns by my neighbors, and ease of maintenance after the install. As I said earlier, I could have easily mounted my camera on the corner of my house here and just run an ethernet cable to it. But where's the fun in that? Now that the pole was taken care of, I started by installing the solar panel. You might take a different approach, but since the solar panel takes up the most room, I wanted to get that up first so I could then figure out where the rest would go. Usually, mounting a solar panel is pretty straightforward and you probably don't even need instructions. But this kit by New Power was not intuitive at all and the directions were horrible. The mount itself is good though, it just took me 30 minutes of assembling and disassembling the mount in different ways to figure out how it worked. I was a little concerned when I ordered it that it would not be very strong since it only has two arms and supports the top of the panel with the bottom floating out in space. Other mounts I've used in the past will have at least one more arm connected to the bottom of the panel for strength and rigidity. But this system seems plenty strong for a 100 watt panel. I definitely wouldn't go any bigger though. After finally getting the mounting system installed and the solar panel up on the pole, I needed to aim it in the right direction and angle for the most sun exposure. I've covered this in quite a few other videos, but the general rule to use on a fixed position solar panel is to match the angle of the panel to the degree of latitude of your geographic location. That will give you a good year-round compromise to ensure decent production in both summer and winter. Obviously you can adjust the angle of the panel in different seasons to get more production, but sometimes that isn't possible or practical. So for now, I set my panel at approximately the right angle, and I'll come back to that later and fine tune the angle. I also pointed the panel to the south since I live in the northern hemisphere, and that will give me the most production for the entire day. Again, there are other considerations that can play into which direction to face the panel, such as obstructions, higher energy needs during certain parts of the day, etc. But pointing it south gives the most overall energy and best compromise between morning and afternoon power. The next largest component is the battery enclosure. After I received the enclosure and the batteries, it was time to figure out how to mount the batteries. In hindsight, this process would have been a whole lot easier if I had ordered the metal mounting plate for this enclosure but they wanted 25 US dollars for it, plus another $15 in shipping, so it just didn't seem worth it at the time. Anyway, this enclosure is a good size that gives me room for all of the batteries, plus the wiring and bus bars and fuses. I did order the optional pole mount kit, but it's clearly designed for a large diameter pole like a telephone pole, and it's not ideal for a small pole like mine. So far doing this again, I would skip that component and find another way to mount it. The brackets that you see me playing with here are some framing brackets that I found at Home Depot that were the right size for the width of the enclosure. I thought they could serve as shelves to bear the weight of the batteries and then I could use zip ties or velcro straps to then hold the batteries in place. That was the general idea anyway. In reality, it works but isn't as secure as I would have liked it. Again, if I had to do this over again, I would have just ordered the metal mounting plate from Altelix and that would have given me virtually unlimited mounting options and would have been much more secure. 
After finalizing the mounting of the batteries, I turn to wiring everything up. Since these batteries don't have terminals with screws or bolts, I use some bus bars to make the wiring a little easier. You'll also see me wire in an inline fuse holder on each string of batteries to protect from short circuits. To finish the battery mounting, I hot glued some Velcro straps to the enclosure to keep the batteries from sliding off of the shelves. And here's what the finished enclosure looks like with all of the wiring and mounting completed. Heading back outside, I started to mount the rest of the components to the pole. First, I installed the nano beam radio just beneath the solar panel mount. I mounted it at the same height as the other radio would be mounted on the side of my house and aimed it in that direction. Then I mounted the solar point charge controller underneath the radio. This spot on the pole is halfway between the solar panel on top and where I ended up mounting the enclosure below. That also puts it within just a few feet of all of the components to make the wiring as easy as possible. I mounted the enclosure under the charge controller and this is where I discovered that the pull mount wasn't that great. As you can see the hose clamps are massive and I had to swap them out for some smaller ones off camera. At this point everything was mounted except the camera which I knew was going to go on top of the pole. So I went ahead and started wiring everything up. The solar point charge controller has MC4 connectors built into it, which is pretty rare and a nice feature. That meant that wiring the solar panel was plug and play, whereas I usually have to either cut off the MC4 connectors or fabricate some cable extensions to connect to most charge controllers. Then I connected two ethernet cables to the PoE switch on the charge controller. It's kind of an awkward angle for my camera, but here's what the inside looks like at this point. Then I wired the battery bank from the enclosure through some cable glands on the bottom and then up to the charge controller. Finally, I installed the camera on top and aimed it at the trampoline. With everything installed on the pole, the last piece of the puzzle was the other side of the wireless bridge. I didn't include it in the components list for the project, but I'll show you what I used and how I installed it anyway. I installed it in a vertical position at the same height as the radio on the pole. Here you can see that the two poles line up and have line of sight with each other. The radio that I installed is a Light AP AC, which is a 120 degree radio. The reason I chose that instead of another nano beam is because I'm going to use it as the access point for multiple stations and I needed a wider angle than the nano beam provides. Now that the installation was complete, I began to set everything up and configure it to work together. Now all of this work was done in the hottest part of the summer here in Texas, so I really wanted to get the wireless bridge set up so that I could finish the rest from inside my house. So I connected an ethernet cable directly from the radio to my laptop, set a static IP address for my laptop that was on the same subnet as the default IP of the radio, and connected to its web interface. Then I logged in with the default user credentials provided by Ubiquity. Once I was logged in, I opened up the settings for the bridge and configured a point-to-point -point connection with the light AP attached to the house. Again, I'm obviously not showing every little step-by-step -step here, but just one tip that I learned is make sure you set a channel width and don't just leave it on auto, as my radios could not see each other that way. Anyway, I finally got the bridge set up after some trial and error and Google searching. Now, I was just happy to establish communication at this point, so I'll come back later and fine-tune the performance and signal strength and all of that. Back in the air conditioning in my house, I then connected remotely to the solar point charge controller. I configured the charging settings for the batteries first. Then I configured the two loads. Here you can see the prioritization and scheduling features that are a cool feature of this charge controller. I can set lower priority devices that will shut off when the batteries get a little low and leave the higher priority devices on. I can also set up a schedule for turning on and off certain devices, which I use here to turn the camera off at night when my daughter obviously won't be outside. With everything set up and operating, the dashboard now comes alive with useful information to monitor your system. As I mentioned before, the weather monitoring feature of this charge controller is unique and helpful to prevent outages if you have a mission critical application. Today it's cloudy and there won't be a fully sunny day in the forecast for a while. 
so you can see that it predicts that using my current settings, I'll run out of power after several days. And finally, I configured the camera to work with the rest of the system. This part was pretty much plug and play from my existing Ubiquiti network in my house, so there isn't much to show there. But after viewing the live feed from the camera, I had to make some adjustments to the camera angle, which I did from Ubiquiti's Protect Smartphone app. I've had the system operating now for a few weeks, and it's been working like a charm. The wireless bridge has been rock solid, and I can stream the camera at the highest video settings with no problems at all. The solar's working well too, and the batteries haven't discharged lower than 50% until today, but that's due to the last couple days being partly cloudy. I can now watch my daughter play and listen to her with the built-in microphone on the camera while I work on other things inside the house or garage. So let's recap the project and go over some final information. This project cost me right at 800 US dollars, not counting the other radio attached to the house. If you do want to count that one, add another hundred dollars onto that figure. But either way, that's several hundred dollars less than the cost of the system I built in 2016. The cost of solar has decreased in that time, and the quality and feature set of the components used have improved over the original build. At the end of the day, I now have a better performing system for cheaper, and that is definitely a win-win. Thanks for watching this video. If you're interested in building a system like this yourself, please see the video description for product links and contact information. And if you're new to my channel and you like the video, please consider subscribing.